developers. So the first warning is note that it says for PHP developers. So if you consider yourself a Go developer, you may not learn anything new. It might be a good review, but I'm by no means a Go I'm the obvious. So I'm going to try to explain it to other PHP developers. Um, if, you, if you want to follow along, the slides are up on GitHub. Also, pull requests are welcome. It's public. Um, so just swap the GitHub bio with github.com and swap to put the MRF for like over PHP, and then you can do a pull request on the slides. Um, I'm the director of engineering at Chapter 3, so all day, every day, it's Drupal for me. And then when I go home at night, if I still have any energy left, I'm trying to learn Go. So that that's I've been doing PHP since about 2003, um, and most of that's actually within Drupal. I've definitely done like maybe one standard for PHP project, so there's a lot of Drupal. And um, going, I learned it first at OSCON 2014. I did a tutorial and kind of fell in love with it. So since then, it's been my like hobby language of choice like whenever I'm working on a side project at home. So I'm going to give you some quotes just to give you an idea about why you might want to use it, what kind of projects you might want to use Go on, and like why it's an exciting language, at least for me. So efficient, scalable, and productive. Um, some find it fun to work in, others find it unimaginative and boring, and that can actually be a good thing depending on where you're in your language. So this is Rob Pike, he's the creator of Go. I got a lot of quotes from him. He is both a great presenter and a genius when it comes to language design. So a, a good a good thing to read if you want to know all about the history of Go um, is this talk he gave in 2012 when they were first really announcing the language and really pushing it out there. Um, get really good background in terms of what motivated him to create a language because that's not something you just go and do every day. You need pretty strong motivation to do that. So one of the things that's most interesting, and also I think what makes it fun to work with, is the fact that there really isn't an object-oriented system. You get methods, and that's it. Methods and packages, and packages like aren't really even object-oriented. So um, that makes it a lot like um, if you miss writing Group 7 modules. You know, it's, like, it's a lot, a lot like, right, like writing Group 7 module. You write a lot of functional code, and if you're a good developer, you organize it well, but you don't necessarily have to. Like, language doesn't force you to organize it well. You know, you need to use methods and packages in a smart way. But if you try to do a pull request on a big Go project, the developers will definitely know what they think about. Um, so that one came from Twitter. Um, so this one has come from a totally different angle, which is learning Go as your first programming language. I don't think many people would do that on accident. But um, there's a couple people that have actually stumbled into it. Um, so this was a uh, YouTube video. Um, I definitely recommend watching this YouTube video just for inspiration purposes alone. If you're feeling like it might be a little daunting to learn the language, because she tried Ruby, tried Python, I think, tried a couple of other things, and ended up um, learning more with Go more quickly. Uh, Go is a very opinionated language, so I think it's actually a really good choice for beginners because you can't make beginner mistakes. The like, language just doesn't let you. Your code's not going to compile the time if you if you do it wrong. Um, one of one of the design features of the language is that it has a very small syntax, and that will probably never grow. Um, every new version of Go is just performance improvements, as far as I've seen. Like there's maybe one or two new features that have been added to the language. Um, they're very hesitant to add features to the language. They're very hesitant to even add libraries to the standard library. So what you're working with is pretty much the same. Like when I started in 2014, um, like the, I haven't noticed anything new come in that tripped me up as a beginner. Like, so it, it's, it's a pretty stable language as well. And that's partially by design. Um, so that's a good article to, to read if you just want to like read along with somebody else who's going to go for the first time. So even if you're a dynamic language zealot, which if you use PHP, you might be, like I don't mean, that you're suspect. Um, the static types in Go aren't going to trip you up. It, it, it's what it, this quote is really telling you. Um, you know, static typing helps a lot with the compiler design. It makes it easier for them to write a compiler and make it really performant. And be performant is one of like the base reasons why you can use Go. Yeah, yeah. And, and we'll get into Go format later. It's, it's even before compile time that you, you, you learn about all your errors. And it's um, 
this goes into more of why you would want to use it and where you want to use it. Um, it's no surprise that Google uses this internally a lot, and it's really designed to solve their problems. And so, I mean, if you don't have Google-like problems or Google-sized problems, Go might be a more frustrating language for you. But if you can say to yourself, a systems administrator or DevOps type person, and you know you don't want to use Bash for everything for the rest of your career, like this might be a good language to pick. Or if you just have problems like that, like you know if you're spinning up dozens, hundreds, thousands of containers, like at your job, like maybe you know PHP is not the best language to be doing that. Anyway. So this just be another in graph. Yeah. And so that's uh, you know why com combinator thread. So I, I went all over the internet to find what this was. Um, and so this is Rob Pike again. And so what he, he was saying is part of the reason why the syntax looks like it does is he didn't want to make it hard for someone that knows Java, PHP, C, like any of these languages that look like each other that are all you know based off the C family. He wanted it to make it easy for somebody that knows one of these languages to pick up Go and be productive in it right away. So as a PHP developer, you will be productive right away in Go. Like once you learn the few quirky syntax things, you'll, you'll be able to front code in it. So going into the actual details of the language, um, when we go through a hello world. Um, first of all, though, we're going to have to get it set up. And to me, as the initial like setup of the language is actually one of the more frustrating parts, there was a lot of assumed Unix knowledge, I think, in just in terms of like how you like install an application. And you know, of course, you can add it to your own Bash profile because everybody does that when they install applications. So if you're a Mac user, like the, the way you install Go, I think there's a package now finally, but for a long time there wasn't. But the tutorials you find online are gonna like you know tell you to do things that you may never have done for any other language. So I felt like this was for such an easy language, it was a really unnecessary barrier for entry, so I wanted to go over it and talk. So you go to their download page, uh, you untar it and use your local, uh, might be a different directory on your Mac. Uh, these are Linux instructions. Um, you know, and then you export the path so that you know you can have Go executable from your command line. And you also tell it where the home directory is. This is where you store all of your Go libraries, like similar to like an NPM or something running on your system, or a composer, like you know, you're gonna have Go libraries that are accessible throughout your system. And then you're able to execute Go code. So if, if all of that happened correctly and you use the right paths, like for the package you used and installed it correctly. You should be able to open up your favorite text editor and type this in, and you should be able to type go run and see the output. So I'm going to step through this set of examples just so you guys understand like the core language setup. So top top of the file is package main. So go, like I said, doesn't have an object-oriented system. It just organizes things into package. So best practice in Go is you build libraries for yourself. Like those might be shared across multiple projects, or they might just be within your project itself. But that's the way you're going to organize your code is, is in the libraries. So you basically are going to you know dog food your own libraries that provide little pieces of functionality. So it's, it's also you know Go programs are encouraged to be small, single purpose. And so this helps you you know abstract out your problem into something more generic. And you can also just go on GitHub and find somebody else that also solved that problem in a more generic way. So given that. That's a good article if you want to understand the packaging and sort of more advanced like architecture setups of how you would organize your packages. Um, then, you, then you have an import line. So you Python, looks probably pretty familiar to you. Um, and so this is importing from the standard library. So if you don't see any um, information in front of it, it's just a single line, that's the standard library. So Go comes with an incredibly productive, useful standard library that's very, very well documented. And most things you want to do, like for a really simple program, you're going to be able to do it in the standard library. But also, like simple things aren't going to be available to start with. You're going to have to know where in the standard library to find out like the screen and formatting functions. You're going to have to bring in that library. So learning the standard library is important. But if you're also looking at someone else's Go code, looking at their import statements is a good way to understand what their architecture is, what's their appetite for pulling in other people's code, that kind of thing. And then you have your first function. So the reason we had to import our format library is because we want to be able to print a line. And you know, we can't do that with just the language by itself. We need the format library in there to print the line. So we format a <laughs> print line. 
and we put in hello, and then that's world in Chinese. So this is my one, you know, I'm going to pick on PhD a little bit here, because so Russell's not looking at the PhD. So, if you look at the graph here, this is Unicode code usage across the web. I don't know who compiled this or where. I just needed a higher resolution version of this, and I found it in Google Images. But so in 2005, Unicode started to pick up, and as you can see, it's blowing away all other formats. And so you know, everybody knows why we don't talk about that last version of PHP. So Go had it a lot easier because they immediately wrote the language from the ground up with Unicode, Unicode support built in. So Unicode code support in Go is really good. No surprise because this was already happening before they even started working on the language. So Go get, um, I mentioned going on GitHub and finding other people's libraries. Um, I would always look in the standard library first. That's kind of just the, I don't know, people want to use a standard library whenever. I'm sure if you did a code review and you worked with a bunch of Go developers, they would tell you, why didn't you use the standard library? Why did you go get this heavy library from GitHub? So, you know, look at the standard library first, but if you don't find it there, or if you really do want to build something more complicated, you can go on GitHub, you type go get, and then the name of the, the module on GitHub, uh, package on GitHub, and, um, you, you will uh, download that into your Go folder. Then we back back a few slides ago, we, we set up that Go folder, and so that becomes available then in your um, in your any any of your Go programs on that system. So uh, Netflix has a package called Chaos Monkey. This isn't probably a good one to look at if you want to just run Go, but it's, it's for managing um, uptime of. Uh, containers that suddenly go down. So, like, this is how they keep track of how many containers go up and down all the time, and they have like, millions of containers running. So, they wrote that in Go. So, Go Run is how you um, execute the, uh, the the file. So, this isn't compiling. This is just um, executing the code. So, this will look in this will look for a func main in a package main, and it'll execute it. And so this is um, until you're done with the program. While you're while you're just sitting there like working on the code, you'll just hit go run over and over again it's like this a lot. And so that's just how how you execute that code. Go build will actually build a package. So this is, this is a compiled language. So you're gonna this will actually build your binary for you. And so the first place it looks is main, and then everything in will be included in main, and then it'll build a binary after that. Um, so th this is my favorite part of the language. This is, I think, what made me fall in love with Go, and also made me feel really productive in it, like after, like one hour into a tutorial, which is uh, Go format. So Go throws out all of the noise. Uh, any Silicon Valley fans here? So tabs versus spaces, nobody debates that in Go. Um, it won't allow you to include a library um, that isn't used. So if you include a library with an import at the top of your program and you don't use it, you can't compile that file. Um, it, it makes you use tabs. Everybody who uses Go has to use tabs. But you can set up Go format to automatically um, you know, turn your spaces into tabs you know, when you save the file, which is what I do, because my code looks like triple code a little bit. And it, you just get rid of all the arguments. Like different companies don't have different Go standards. You know, they don't, they don't put them on GitHub and argue about which one's better. It's the language defines the standards for everybody, which makes it mean you can get somebody's Go code from anywhere and you'll understand it. Function syntax. Um, if you use, if you've worked in C before, it looks pretty familiar. Um, so the top one, we're defining two variables. And then the, the one outside of the parentheses is the return type. So you will always want to define the return type. Um, in the uh, second example, we're defining the type of, of the variables that are in the, in the argument and also the return type. And in the third example, we, you can define multiple return types and arguments are required. So the language allows you to return more than one value at a time? Yeah. That, that's the third example. Yeah. Variables um, is statically typed language, but like that quote says, it's not really that frustrating once you're working with it. Um, and you can also, and when you're declaring the variables, give them a default value, which is what that second line is there. 
and it has all of the standard types you would expect. Like it's you know there's there's no surprises there. Um, this one tripped me up, so I so I dedicated a whole slide to it. It makes the code look weird, I, I, for, for lack of a better. It, you know, it's, it's not a feature that's common in other languages, at least not languages that I've worked in. So it's, it's declaration plus assignment, and it's really commonly used all over everyone's Go code. And it also has a second um, second use case where it's in an if statement. It also can execute a statement like in the middle of your if statement. So don't get tripped up by it. It's, it's, it's declaring and assigning a variable, and declaring and assigning something else. Or if it's executing a statement, it's more if statement. So you're just saying, I know I'm doing a new variable here. Yeah, exactly. Just, this was on purpose, not yeah, on accident. Yeah. And if there's an equal sign, you know, because it's really hard to switch from JavaScript to Go. It's like you don't want to write both of them on the same day. Because um, <laughs> if, if you do an equal like you would in JavaScript, you, you'll get, get an error because it's only for assigning value that the variable already has to exist. But if you, if, but if you do, the, uh, the assign and create, then, then it, that doesn't trip you up. So, but it's hard to type if you can do a JavaScript all day. So this shows you the method syntax. So this is it. This is the whole object oriented system in, in Go. So all you do is you do the client, you, you declare the uh, the method here. Oh, no, so, yeah, sorry, that's the method. And so um, we basically create the simple object and then you can call the method. And so, sorry for the spacing here. I don't think I pulled the slide to go code it work. I think you understood what that meant. So, um, pretty simple example of you know the math functions, or you know would definitely be somewhere where you wouldn't want methods collected together because they would probably all be related to each other. This is another one that tripped me up. It's definitely worth uh, spending some time talking about. So arrays aren't anything like you think of arrays from PHP. Arrays are just um, a, a collection of values, and they're also fixed at the time you create them. So when you create an array, you create the size of the array when you create it. And in practice, you don't work directly with arrays very much at all in Go. Um, what you work with is slices, and so slices can be any part of an array, or any collection of values, um, you can grab multiple slices from your array. And so the slices are like you know, chunks of arrays. So you might get you know, all the European countries out, out of an array that contains all the countries. But arrays only have single values. Um, you can't grow them after you create them without copying them and, and creating a new copy of the array. So, so basically, it's, it's a very like, fixed structure that isn't going to change. And you're going to probably define those values when you first create it, and then you're going to access the values by pulling slices out. So a slice is usually a, a chunk of the array. And so the first syntax is the array syntax, um, and the second syntax is the uh, slice syntax. Um, the zero value of the slice is nil. Um, it's another one where you don't want to switch from JavaScript to Go in the same day. But so so nil values are used throughout Go to describe empty structures. So if there's any kind of empty structure that you're passing, it, it, it will return nil, which is really useful when you're writing error checking code because you can rely on an empty value returning nil. Um, if, if you want to append a value to a slice, uh, use the append method. Maps. So maps are more similar to what a, a PHP developer would think of an array. So it's going to be key value. Um, it can be any two types, though. It doesn't have to be strings and, and whatever. You can, you, can de you can declare the types for your map. Um, and that, that's up to you what you declare. And you can add a value just like that. So that, that's a lot more familiar if you write a lot of PHP. Then you also have structs. Um, in my head, I think of structs as content types and fields. So um, just because I, I don't know, I, PHP was my first backend language, and so I, I didn't have the luxury of learning data structures until much after I learned PHP. And so, you know, the structs allowed you to declare variables of different types and um, <coughs> store them in, you know, this structure, and then you can pull them out using this syntax as well as assigning values using that syntax. So, extremely useful, especially if you know it gives you basically like a, a miniature I don't know, database within your program to, to work with. 
But your, your example here doesn't have any behavior. It only has um, data members, like a, like a C struct would. Um, does, did you have behaviors in a struct as well? Like methods? Yeah, you could put that in the he had an example earlier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the, the ads one, you kind of, the vertex, you're kind of tagging it in, it's not declared from in. Yeah. It is declared from in. It is part of the patient that it's not written. <laughs> That's also from the GoDash. Um, I 
I had some trouble preparing a good concurrent example because things execute so quickly and go that you know it's, it's hard to tell if it's actually running concurrently or not, especially when you're not talking to a slow external server. I should have tested on Friday when all the servers were down. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if that code could execute slowly, you might see the execution here um, you know, be in a different order than you expect because both of those functions can run concurrently. So that, that's, that's not as, as simple um, as you can get with, in terms of explaining how concurrency works. I've got another example as well that gets a little bit deeper, but you know, this is the part of language where doing Go for like an hour once a week, like you don't really get to understand this very well. So like if, if you have questions here, it's much better to go look at someone else's code that you know runs on thousands of servers, millions of servers, and see how they're doing concurrency. It's like a lot better than looking at these simple examples. But but what's important to know is if you have a problem that you think could be solved by concurrency, Go is a good language to reach for. So channels are how Go routines communicate. So these routines, they may be, some of them may be running for a long time, some of them may be running for a short time, but they need a way to communicate back to the main uh, thread of execution. So channels are the pipes that connect to Go routines. So you know you don't want Go routines without channels; they, they work side by side. So now I'm going to go. I have to jump back to my laptop, but I'm, I'm going to go through some code I wrote in the set description I promised a simple program. So I can show you how simply you can write a rep web server and talk to a web server and go. So this code is also up on my GitHub as well if you want to look at it. So let's see what we got. So first we'll look at it. So um, <coughs> there we go. All right. So this is my server. So um, pretty simple. Um, I, I have to import a few packages. Uh, these are all from the standard library. So I got NetHTTP. You always import format every time if you want to fit strings out on the command line or to a server. Um, I want to pull these at random so you can see the thing changing. And then I also, where am I using log? Oh, I'm logging a fatal error if I'm unable to create the server where I expect to be able to create it. So I got one function in here. Um, creates my array of witticisms and then um, prints, prints one out. So in terms of memory handling, I might not want to do that in the same function where I print it out, but we're not going to criticize this too much. And then um, in the main function, which is what will execute when I type go run, so I create a HTTP handler. That's, this is all in the HTTP library. And so what that's, what's that going to do is it's going to create a, a server that will respond at that path, you know, I'm going to put it on port 999 because I probably have Node or something running on some other port, so that seems like a safe number. And um, it, it'll it'll error out if I'm unable to create that server. So fingers crossed. All right. No errors yet. All right. Got a full screen. Um, I probably could have picked a better. Yeah. All right. And so we've got our first Go web server. And what was that? 20 lines of code, 22. So HTTP package is really useful. You'll see it used all over the place because communicating over HTTP is a lot of how Go programs communicate across servers. And so then I also wrote a client. Um, also uses HTTP to hit the server. And then um, I'm using the IO package to pull in the body and, and print it out to the command line. Um, 
the IO package, some people like to use some, you know, contributed ones available on Git, uh, GitHub, but uh, it works. It's just a little bit like more dense to go through the documentation. Um, we're also going to error out if we don't get a response, but since we already confirmed the server is working, this should work as expected. So. <coughs> All right, so that's it, simple. Every time we call it, it, brings back a different value. I only have five, so that ran function is sometimes it'll return the same value. So that's it for this straightforward you know, implementation. Um, you know, simple function calls to a server. That's how simple a, a server call can be in Go. But, Check out current. Okay. And I should probably stop my server. I don't, I don't think I, the server changes on that branch, but it's not in live demos and all that. We don't want to introduce any. Okay. Rerunning my server. So here we changed my client a little bit. So here we're going to use the Go routine, and we're going to loop through a for loop 5,000 times and see how fast Go can respond when I'm when I'm calling my server. So zoom in here. So it goes fast like super fast, um, and that would run almost as quickly even without the concurrent call. So, so I mean, everything about the language is optimized for speed, memory usage, um, all, all those things where it's going to actually cost Google tens of thousands of dollars if something is slower to execute, like that, you know, that was their priority. So that's where they leave features out, and sometimes the code's a little bit harder to write, but all of those things are going to save, you know, that, that run time. So, Change this to a higher number because that went exceptionally fast. Let's do fifty thousand. Definitely too fast to read. So that that just gives you a taste of concurrency. And, and what, what you might be able to do. I mean, all we're doing is serving up strings. It's not exactly like taxing my server very hard. Um, I was gonna keep htop open while I did this, but I couldn't even see the memory tick up, so it wasn't very interesting. So, like, that didn't, no, nobody, the web server didn't work very hard, and neither did the client to, to make that happen. All right. That's it for demo. And so, um, I, so I, I've spent a lot, a lot of time trying to learn on my own um, in my spare time. Like I said, and every time I go back, I have to relearn things because you know, sometimes it's a couple weeks before I get back to run something good. Um, it's really hard to find a relevant project to write and go. Um, and so that, 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 I think that's been one of my bigger struggles is just finding something that like has to be in Go, like that wouldn't be faster to write in Python or easier to write, you know, in PHP. Um, so effective Go uh, is is a good source. Um, so the Go project itself just does an incredibly good job of providing resources, but the resources can be a little bit intense if you don't have a C background or you don't have a background in another compiler language. But if you do, like those things, you'll digest them really quick. Tor of Go? Tor of Go. Oh, yeah, no, I got that one. Um, so, R Golang, R Learn Golang, those, I found a lot of new things by, by visiting that. So, that seems to be like if something, you know, some of these have been around for five years, some of them are brand new. So, that's a good If you want to find out what's new, like new blog posts, new videos, and stuff that people are doing, that's the place to go. Um, this course only costs $25, and it's incredibly deep. Uh, I think it's great for if you're if you've always been a developer doing uh, web web development because he goes through 
it was a little frustrating. I had to watch the exercises on like double time. But he goes through all of the like the baseline things, which is like you know what exactly is a bite and what does that mean. Like he, he went like like it's almost CS 101 followed by a go course. So anyway, like you might want to fast forward through the first like 40 exercises. But, <laughs> the, but, but uh, if you know yeah. that by heart, but for me it was a good refresher because in Go you're working with things at a lot lower level. Like you know, if you want to work with a character. Like, you know, it's very often in Go that you're working with bytes, like, and the language really kind of steers you in that direction. So sometimes it's going to be a refresher because the PHP you're like usually very far away from that aspect. $19, there you go, on sale. He's, he's got a good style, and, and like, and you can definitely, you know, watch it on double time, and his voice is annoying, so that's good. It's $19 if you buy it before midnight tonight. Midnight tonight, alright, we've got a time pressure. Uh, this does a good job of explaining uh, CSV um, closure using the same system as well. And uh, this article is easier to understand than any of the Go developers' explanations. So sometimes taking it out of the language makes it clearer when you don't care about the language syntax. Um, effective Go, hey look, I got it twice. It's that important. <laughs> All right. this, this is where I've been living in terms of practicing Go. So HackerRank is great for um, giving you really arbitrary problems to solve. And um, I've been trying to do them all in Go. It supports like 15 other languages as well for most of the exercises. But anyway, just it gives you basically the coding quizzes, like you know, if you've ever applied for a job at a Silicon Valley startup, the same kind of coding quizzes that you're gonna get on the whiteboard there, like it just throws a bunch of them at you. And, and that's perfect for if you want to spend 20 minutes and maybe learn something new about the language, like you know, maybe learn a new like part of the standard library that you didn't know about. Uh, this is uh, that woman's presentation where she went through as a total beginner. It's just good information if you're trying to get motivated. Uh, this, this is a free ebook available online, Building Web Apps with Go. This, more than anything, is probably relevant if you're a bunch of Drupal developers in terms of like something you might actually be able to. You got a single page app, and then maybe you're going to get another Drupal site, maybe just the, the back end and Go and the front end and React. And, and then uh, Golang Bootcamp as well has, has a bunch of um, exercises as well. So, uh, incredible amount of resources. And, and last but not least, and this is incredible just because of the fact that when you download and install Go, it's already on your system and you can run it on your local host. So even on Friday, you could have spent all day going through the Go tour, you know, even when DNS was down, because you already had a local copy of it and you could run. So just Go tool tour, it spins up a server and you can use it on your local machine. But it's also available online. Exorcism.io is also really great. Yeah. I, I, I like go through and go exercises and people will come along and give you pull request to code with you. Exorcism.io? Okay, yeah. no, I'll check that out. <laughs> So these are some examples that um, people pointed at as if you're trying to understand good Go architecture where you should look. Um, so SED, written in Go, Docker, which I'm sure a lot of you use, is written in Go, and so that's a good one. They also have a really friendly community, and they have a lot of issues tagged as beginner issues. So if you want to try out your first Go pull request, Docker might be a good place to do it. And um, GoBot. It's cool, just like as something you might want to run on your chat server, and then you can hack on it as well. So I got I got some credits. So uh, this presentation was compiled using this guy's. Um, uh, so there's a make file for this presentation. So you know I type I typed make every time I wanted to build up the slide um, slide the slides get built up build up reveal.js, but I wrote the whole thing in Markdown. So if you like Markdown, you like hammering in a text file instead of like playing with funky JavaScript, you can still use Reveal and make pretty slides and you can do it all in Markdown. And Renee French is responsible for this guy. So it's like, come for the mascot, stay for the code. I don't know what that <laughs> slogan is, but Go definitely has the best mascot. So um, if, if you like that guy, um, he's responsible and his art is incredible and there's thousands of versions of the Go Gopher. It's controversial whether or not he has a name, so people just call him the Go Gopher. But he might have a name, he might not. He doesn't have an official name. Yes. 
so I have time was I don't know I think I'm pretty close to time. Anybody have any questions? What have you used it for your own projects? I tried to rebuild Drush and go. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> just, just to see how fast you would be. But, but then I learned how quick, very quickly how much, how often and how, like, off the, how much Drupal gets bootstrapped by Drush. And so it's like any performance gains I was going to get were lost as soon as Drupal bootstrapped. So like, I, that, that's when I gave up. Is when I was trying to, when I was trying to execute PHP with Ingo, I realized that I was like going down, like I was making bad life decisions. So. <laughs> Oh, I just wondered where you think this fits in into what what its niche is. I mean, do you need to be working with really large data sets or to make it worthwhile to use Go? I, I think container management is really like it's sort of that. It's where it's being used the most currently. So, you know, if, um, yeah, if you need to like check on the status of multiple containers, spin them up quickly, tear them down quickly, like all, all of that, like I think that's, so, so people with lots of customers, you know, that or you know, lots of lots of clients that, that want to manage, but any kind of systems level problem like that, where it's like I'm dealing with more servers than I even know that I have. Like all I do is look at the Amazon bill at the end of the month. Like those kind of problems are good for you. Yeah.